Proverbs 21. We got to pick it up in verse 23 and um, don't have a lot of time. So if you're there with me, please say amen. amen. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Troubles, plural. A proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. The desire of the lazy man kills him for his hands refuse to labor. He covets greedily all the day, but the righteous gives and does not spare. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with wicked intent? A false witness shall perish, but the man who hears him will speak endlessly. A wicked man hardens his face, but as far as the upright, he establishes his way. That's a new sound from the train. <laughs> we won't hear that sound at the new building. Amen. Amen. Verse 30, there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. Say amen. amen. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. And Father, we thank you today for allowing us to gather here, Lord God, and be in this place. And we know it's only, only because you're faithful. Uh, that you kept us through the night watches, that you've given us the ability to rise with air in our lungs and strength in our legs and to come here and uh, this morning to worship you. And we're thankful for that. And so, Lord, we pray that you would take this moment, uh, that you would uh, remove all of the things that would hinder us, Lord. Uh, help us to lay down the stuff we're worried about outside of this room that's part of this life, the things of this world. Uh, that you would remove the uh, distractions from the room, even the work of the enemy, that we would have uh, a free hour with you just to hear what you would say to us by your spirit. And we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we look at, at this, um, I didn't ask if you, anybody was visiting, I don't believe, this time around. Um, and so, uh, but if you're just new to joining us um, as we are traveling through Proverbs chapter by chapter and verse by verse as we, as Calvary Chapel tends to do uh, anytime we're gathered in any book. And this one in particular has been speaking to all of the issues of life. God gave Solomon wisdom, Solomon's writing to his children to give them wisdom to, to navigate life. Um, but the author is the Holy Spirit and he's dealt with everything from marriage to, um, to temptations, to relationships, parenting, discipline, uh, discipline in life, finances, business, uh, anything you can think about, it's come up here in the book of Proverbs um, because it's for us. And I know many of you read through Proverbs every month, um, but as we read it, what God is doing is he's causing these things to, to, um, to be written upon the heart, to take root here that the Holy Spirit can use it in time of need. Amen. Um, and so we need all of these things. And so as we go through these particular verses, um, some of them fairly simple and straightforward, others maybe not so much, but let's see what he would give us. Verse 23, he says, whoever guards his mouth, notice and tongue, keeps himself from no troubles, plural, and many different things. But to guard his mouth and his tongue, he didn't have to use uh, both of those words here. He could have just said guard his mouth or he could have simply said just guard the tongue as you see often in the scriptures, but his emphasis being placed on it because there's something very important <clears throat> about the need for us to, to learn how to guard or keep our tongue uh, as we're going to learn. And this has been a common theme we've seen uh, in the book of Proverbs. It's come up many times over and over and we see it throughout the scriptures as well. And when something that's such a common theme and it's repeated over and over and over with emphasis, it's as if the Holy Spirit is saying to us, this is one that you really need to get a handle on. In fact, if I review for you, it was back in Proverbs 12, 13, where the scriptures told us the wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his what? Lips. That's right. Somebody knew it. It didn't even before it hit the screen. That's what <laughs> Goldsboro. <laughs> that's right of his lips exactly 
And remember, transgression is a sin, but it's a sin where you knew the line was there. You knew the rule was there, but you chose to break it. Everybody understand that? Um, there's something to that. I'll come back to it. So, so the wicked are ensnared by the transgression of their lips. They, they purposely use their mouth the wrong way. They lie. They gossip. They say things they shouldn't. They use their words wrongly, which we'll get to. Um, so there's something to learn from that. Proverbs 13, 13 says, he who guards his mouth preserves his life notice. We'll get to that in a moment. So there's self-preservation. But he who opens wide his lips shall have notice destruction. The person with no filter, no restraint, destruction is coming. Um, and this is what the Proverbs continue to tell us. And then it gets even, even more personal. Proverbs 18 21, y'all remember where it says death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so remember, we talked about that over and over and over. It's not a positive confession teaching or something that maybe the prosperity gospel people may use, but the scripture is still the scripture. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because some people took it too far. The verses is saying exactly what it means that there is life or there is death and life in the power of the tongue in that you can use your words in a, in, a, in a way as tools, if you will, in a way to either speak life into people's lives or destruction. You can build your marriage up by the encouraging words that you use to strengthen and encourage and uh, help heal and all of the things that are needful within your marriage where you can destroy your marriage by being verbally abusive and create an angry and bitter spouse or parents can can destroy children or they can build them up or the same with friends or just within the body of Christ itself. You can speak life and you can speak death. And the thing is, the verse says, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You'll eat the fruit of that which you plant by the use of your words. So if you want a happy marriage or a blessed marriage, you want to use your words to shower your, your spouse with the life and the love and words that put that into them and encourage them, or you can get the other in reverse. And so we need to, uh, to understand that. It's not that we're going to create our own reality in the sense of God is a genie and you say whatever you say he has to do. But no, it's saying that we have the power within our words to use them the way God intended and that changes situations. You know, your words can change situation on the job. Your response can set the mood for what happens next. You know, we understand that. Um, we see that throughout scripture. So it's very important um, for us to take that into, into account. And then as James tells us, in James chapter 3, New Testament, chapter 3, verse 2, he says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able to also to bridle the whole body. James goes on to say in the same chapter, verse eight, that no one can tame the tongue. It's something that he describes as being uh, on, set on fire by hell, full of deadly poison. That's what he says. And he says it is a destructive thing. It's like a little flame that creates a whole forest fire, if you will. And that's the picture he paints for the fact that our words can destroy families and, and relationships and marriages and, and create financial uh, problems and all of these things. And so as we begin to get into to looking at this and even the verse that we're in, it becomes evident that the believer has a responsibility as well as a need for our own life's sake to begin to learn to be disciplined with our speech. Jesus even said that every idle word that we speak, we will give an account for in, in heaven. In the kingdom, when we stand before the Lord at the Bema seat, uh, y'all know what the Bema seat of Christ is, right? The Bible says we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. And that's not a, a judgment of condemnation, but it's the judgment seat where Christ brings his believers, his disciples in. He reconciles all things and then he brings us into his everlasting kingdom. But there's some stuff that got to be dealt with on the way in. That means that when I see Jesus finally, not only is there a discussion about a lot of other things, but even my words and how I use them. Oh, my Lord, how I spoke to my spouse 
how I spoke to my children, how I use my words in the midst of fellowship within the body of Christ and all of these things. And so it becomes very evident that we have a responsibility to begin to, um, if you will, be disciplined with how we speak. The believer has a responsibility to be disciplined with the very things that come out of our mouth. The Bible says that we are the salt of the earth and that we are the light of the world. We are the representatives of Christ. Peter described us as a holy nation, a royal priesthood, that we proclaim the praises of him who, who called us. And he's brought us out of darkness into the marvelous light and all of these things over and over and over and over. So therefore now we who represent him, we who are born by his spirit, we can't just be talking loosely anymore. Isn't that something? We don't have, if you will, the liberty to just say whatever comes across our mind anymore. And the thing I like about old people, and I look forward to becoming old, is they got this freedom that's attractive. Like an older person, they've been through so much that they are the age now that they're going to say whatever and the world comes across their mind. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I, I love it. It's fun to watch, you know. <laughs> Very honest, no holes barred. And we, we give them grace because they're old and they're cute and stuff. <laughs> And they're going to heaven and all and, and stuff, so we, we're gracious. But, but the reality, though, is, is that we have to be very, very careful with our words. And we also have to be careful not to neglect saying the right things when we need to, even if it's uncomfortable, because the Bible even says a word fitly spoken is a very valuable thing. So therefore, we, we got so much responsibility as believers to think about and use our words as an opportunity to build up, to tear down, to correct, to encourage, and all of these things that are necessary. And so this is an important thing for us to consider. So as we go back into the verse, it says, whoever guards his mouth and tongue. And, and I think that he, he really there is, is being um, redundant for a reason. I think that it's not just the words that come out of our mouth. Sometimes it's the gestures, even when you get good at not saying it, but you know, you, you make gestures still. And a person that knows you, they know what you're saying. Like they see, I see husbands and wives laugh and I won't call them out because we, when you're married, you've got a lot of nonverbal language going on and it can be just as bad. And so he's really saying, Hey, we need to be careful with these things. So whoever learns to do this, in other words, the mark of spiritual maturity is being able to bridle the tongue and being able to manage what comes out of your mouth, how you use your eyes and your body language and everything else that goes into it to be, uh, if you will, a, a tool in God's hands to bring about the right types of things. Um, so whoever is able to do that, the, the verse says, keeps his soul from troubles, plural, all types of troubles keeps his soul from it. But why does he have to use the word soul here? Um, what, what's implied there? I mean, every time I see that, I have to stop. When, it's, when it says the soul all the way through the book of Proverbs, that speaks of something really deep to me. It's not a surface level thing that's happening here. In other words, there's something that permeates through who I am if I'm not doing this. Look, we, we, we kind of know because we've used it before, but this word soul, if you like to take notes and you like to look up in the Greek, um, you can look it up in your Strong's Concordance. It's number H5315, Nepes. And, and look, it means the life or the inner being of man, the seat of emotions where we would say the mind is it's the mind or the heart. We use the word heart for a lot of things in the English language. So there's a heart that's beating on the inside, but we use it in a lot of ways, you know, um, and, and we understand that. And so it, it really gets to something else. Um, and this is why I think Proverbs said early on in the book of Proverbs that we are to guard the heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. Y'all understand what I'm saying? You know, it's kind of like, you know, be careful with your heart, guard it. Like if, if, God is, if God is telling you not to deal with something, don't let your heart get tied to it because it's going to be harder to get away from it, whatever that is, that probably made sense to somebody. God is like, guard your heart, guard your heart. Don't give your heart to things that are not good. Hey, Solomon, don't give your heart to these foreign women that you're marrying because they're going to take it away from me which is what happened. He drifted away. He let his heart get tied up in the wrong things. So we have to begin to be really careful. So the soul, the seed of who I am, what is this soul thing though? How does it work? Well, look, it, it kind of works this way. 
We see the word soul, the, 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 um, I meant to say Hebrew earlier, not Greek. But we see this word soul in the Hebrew back in Genesis chapter 1 four different times. And then in chapter 2 verse 7, we see it in this way. I'm going to put it on the screen so we understand. It says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became I'm reading it in my notes from the King James. Man became a living soul. Same word in the New King James on the screen, a living being. But that's the same word that we're using for soul here in verse 23. So it's very interesting. So Adam became a living soul or or life, a living soul once God breathed into him. But he already had a body. So then that implies that Adam was a triune being. He had a body. God formed him out of the dirt. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. But also he was spiritually connected to God because God said in the day that he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said to Adam, when you eat that that tree that you're not supposed to, you're going to surely die. And in that day, that 24 hour period where he ate of that, something took place. We would say, well, he didn't really die, Pastor Kevin, but the reality is something changed and he knew it changed because he said to Eve, we naked and we need to do this, get these fig leaves and let's make some clothes. And when God showed up and and, and talked to them, why are you hiding? Well, we were naked. Well, how did you know you were naked? Did you eat of the tree you weren't supposed to? They died. There was a physical, uh, excuse me, a spiritual separation in relationship that he had with God. And the crazy thing about it is from that point, until Christ, all relationship with God was mediated through the sacrifice of an innocent substitute animal. Blood had to be shed. This is why God accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's, because Abel sacrificed an animal and shed blood because he understood it. And Cain wanted to, in his own pride, look what I grew and, and bring his, his, his stuff and God didn't know. It's not about what you grew and it was great. It was great fruit and vegetables, I'm sure. Blood had to be shed and that's why it wasn't accepted. So from that point until Christ, it was all mediated that way. Now it's still mediated that way, but through the finished work of the shed blood of, uh, blood of Christ on the cross. Amen? So we understand that. But then here's the thing. So now Adam becomes kind of a dual person, if you will, as opposed to triune. He has a body. He has a soul. But it's spiritually he's separated from God. There's a spiritual death that's taken place. Now, when you read the genealogy of Christ in Luke's gospel, I won't t- take time to turn there, but it actually calls Adam the son of God. And it describes, I believe, his triune being before he fell. But then throughout the rest of the New Testament, the son of God or the sons of God only refer to angels. And we see that in Genesis 6. We see that in Job. Everybody with me so far? Okay. And then man is not called a son of God anymore until you get to the New Testament when those who... um, who has given power to be uh, sons of God, have the spirit of God. I know I misquoted that, but those who have the spirit of God are the sons of God. So therefore, when we were, as Jesus said, born again, guess what? We're triune again. Raise your hand if you're born again. Ooh, that's good. That means you are a trinity, if you will, made in God's image because you have a body that's made of dirt, basically. You have a living soul but now you have a spirit by which you are connected to the living God. You know, so that's why Paul could say to the Colossians, you are, not will be, you are complete in Christ. Amen? Now, we'll be perfected in the resurrection, but we're already complete in Christ. We're triune being. I love that. So we have a, we have a, we have a, a spirit, we have a soul, we have a, a body. The body is how we express, how the soul expresses its, its, itself um, you know, to one another, you know, and all that kind of stuff. That's why, that's why the demons always want to possess a body. So they can, I'm, I'm going too far though. I want to stay focused because, that, because it's a, it's a, no, it's actually a point I want to make and I'm, I'm getting off track. All right. So then sometimes what we do is we describe like um, the conflict that's going on on the inside of us. We always say it's like a tug of war, like, you know, um, the flesh and and, and, and this, the spirit are, you know, at war, which they are in scripture. So we say that the one that wins, is, we always describe it as two dogs in a fight. And the one that wins is the one you feed, right? And I think that's a little disrespectful. So I won't use that analogy anymore. I don't think it's that way. That's not really what's going on. I actually, I think what, what's happening, as Paul does describe it to the Galatians, that the, the spirit and the flesh, the, splash, the fre- uh, flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, 
so that we don't do the things that we want. And I think what happens is that there is that battle happening, but we tend to yield to the one that we are familiar with, the one that we've spent the most time interacting with. So therefore, if you spend all of your time in the flesh, enjoying the things of the world and, and, and letting the flesh get its comfort and it's, it's all its stuff it wants to do, and that's where you spend your time, then you're going to be carnal. You're going to be fleshly and you're going to tend to lean to the flesh. But if you spend time in the spirit, yielding to the spirit as he leads you into the word of God and by the word of God, and because the word of God is a discerner of carnal and spiritual things and is able to do all that stuff. And if you're, if you're, if you're walking in the spirit, then that's why the Bible says you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh because you're more familiar with the spirit than you are the flesh. And when you're in the spirit, the things of the flesh and the things the flesh tries to get you to do, you're just like, no. No, that's not what I'm doing, you know, and and so you have the strength by the spirit to to say no to those things. The Bible says that by the spirit, you mortify, put to death the deeds of the flesh is what the scripture says, Romans chapter eight. And so what happens is your soul is 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 going to is, is going to give itself to that, which is, is is more familiar with. We have our free will in our soul and we can choose. And so we need to choose the things of God. And we need to grow in and be strengthened in the things of God so that we not give ourselves to the things of the flesh. Let me put it this way before I move on. A lot of times we try to, we, well, no, let me just use this example. If you spend all of your time eating all your comfort food, vegging out on all of the, um, the entertainment that's out there in the media, you spend all your time on the internet looking at all kinds of things and I would say, you know, a lot of times, you know, my guys, we, we, you spend your time on the Internet, sometimes looking at the wrong things when you're when you're actually trying to go through your life and your day, you're going to be automatically drawn to that stuff because that's what you're familiar with. That's what you've given yourself to. And you won't have the strength to resist those things. Um, and that's why sometimes you see a guy, a guy's attention will get caught and he'll linger long because he can't he's given to that. He's carnal. It's an indication that he's carnal. You know, there's nothing that says that a man has to look at anything. Like people put us down like we're just these creatures and we don't have any control. We're, so we can't not look. That's not what scripture says. If we're disciplined, if you, and if you give yourself to the things of the spirit, I should say, then you have the strength not to look. And I don't want to put it all on the men because women are just as bad. They're just operating with a different type of technology. No, I just mean it because guys, we, we beat ourselves up. They do the same thing. It's just that their technology is different. The amount of pixels and the speed of their lens is faster. So they can, they can pan a room and capture everything and then play it back in their mind while they're still walking. The dude is still looking. The woman, she scanned it. She caught it. It's there. Ladies, am I wrong? Yeah, that's right. So, so it's just as bad. And so they just have different technology. And they have to have that kind of technology because they're designed to be help meets, meaning they, they, trying to, they got kids, they got husband, they trying to help. He can't figure things out. They got kids going on. So they have to, all, they have to do a lot of things at once. So that's why God gave them a different technology. Um, so ladies, you got to use your technology the right way because you're just as bad as we are. So all of these things, what I'm saying is then what happens is there's a responsibility we have with our eyes, um, with our ears, but also with our words. Because if we misuse those things, it can kind of begin to def defile the, the, the soul. Um, Paul said it to Timothy this way in 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. He says, now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some would depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving uh, spirits and doctrines of demons speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscious seared with a hot iron. I, I just wanted to point that verse out because I like the way it words it, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. A searing is when, when, you, when you sear something, I guess it, it cuts off the flow of things, you know. Um, uh, it's kind of like the fact that, you know, when you sear a steak, it, you know, on both sides to block the, the escape of the juices to keep it tender and moist. Am I right, cooks in here? And, 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 all right. That's the purpose of it. Well, he's describing a searing of the conscience when you give yourself over to things. And as believers, born again believers, we're being led of the spirit. So there's a responsibility there. So when the Holy Spirit says, don't say something, 
I kind of think we better be careful. Turn your eyes from something. Because otherwise, he says here in the verse, he keeps his soul from troubles. And this bothers me. If my words can cause my soul to have troubles, then now I got a responsibility with my words to be careful what I say, how I say it, when I say it, if I say it. Um, and we learn this as we go, but this is something that we have to take into consideration as we begin to look at this. All right. So we're already over time, but we're going to finish the chapter. <laughs> Verse 24 is 1203. Verse 24 says, a, a proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. Pride is a very interesting thing. Um, so the scoffer then is self-destructive. We know in Proverbs um, not on the screen. You probably have it memorized. 16, 18 says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. So a proud man, a haughty man, a scoffer, he is a self-destructive person. He is headed for destruction and doesn't even know it. Um, one reason, because God's judgment um, is, is towards the scoffer. Proverbs 3.34 says, surely he scorns the scornful but gives grace to the humble. In other words, God is going to scorn the scornful. And so, you know, it may seem like he's getting away with things, but no, his end is destruction. But the humble, to that person, God gives grace. Um, God actually helps the humble. We see it even in the New Testament, James 4, 6. He says, but he gives more grace even. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. He's against him, but he gives grace to the humble. I love that. He gives grace to the humble. Um, in, in, in fact, humility is or was intended to be woven into the culture um, and any culture that respects God will have it. First Peter 5, 5 says, likewise, you younger people submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble over and over and over. We see this. So even the culture and, and you know, it used to be where the culture was this way when I was growing up. In the community I grew up in, you know, every man in my, in, in my church, they, you know, kind of had some level of respect to them. So you're out riding your bike and doing things and playing. If you saw them, we would straighten up, you know, because there's <laughs> Mr. or Deacon so-and-so, you know, and it kind of had a respect to it. And you wouldn't call them by their name, first name, you would put a Mr. before it. Um, and so there would be that kind of thing. It was kind of permeated throughout the community that I grew up in, that there was this, this, this thing that was necessary. Um, but then, you know, as the world creeps in, it's not that way anymore. And so a culture that lacks humility, whether it's a, a, a country, a nation, a, a, a community, a church. And at this point, our world, a, a, a culture that lacks humility is a culture that's gone away from God. You know, when, how do you know? Well, how, what does God look like? Well, we see him in the person of Jesus who humbled himself being, being in the form of God. He humbled himself, didn't count it robbery. He humbled himself all the way to the cross, obedient to the father. Um, Jesus gave us a pattern and a picture. The Bible says that the last days would look this way. It says in the last days, perilous times would come for men would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders. Without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. But they would have a form of godliness, but deny its power. And we are to turn away from such, it says. We are to get away from them because judgment is coming. In other words, it, it describes the times we live in. And the form of godliness mean they'll, they'll even bring it into the church and look like it's okay, which makes it even worse. They deny the power. What power? The power to transform lives, to be submitted to, surrendered to, and changed by God. And so we live in times when it's like that and humility is now gone. And so when we think about these things, a proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name. He acts with arrogant pride. And pride is something that we all have and we need to be careful with. I would say that when God shows you your pride, that's a good thing. If the Holy Spirit can show you that you're being prideful at any point and he does that with us and you notice it with just like the, the, the last verse said, you need to yield to that. When I was saying in the last verse, yield to that and let the Lord work it out in your life because you never want to get to a point where your pride is taken over and you can't even, you can't even see it anymore. Um, you don't want that. That's, that's a bad thing. Um, so... So we go to verse uh, 25 here. 
where it says the desire of a lazy man kills him for his hands refuse to labor. Remember Solomon, he doesn't like the sluggard. He doesn't like the lazy man. He told us to be diligent like the ant back in chapter six. And so this lazy man is that way. And, and there's a picture throughout it. Does it actually kill him? Well, it could, and, and the results could actually kill him, yes. But it's the fact that he, won't, he, he, he wants things that he'll never get because he doesn't have the diligence about him to do anything. And that even works its way out in spiritual things. One commentator, Trapp, explained that mere desire was not enough. Balaam wished well to heaven. So did the young Pharisee in the gospel that came to Christ hastily, but went away heavily. Herod for a long time desired to see Christ, but never stirred out the door to see him. Pilate asked Christ, what is truth, but never stayed his answer. You know, everybody wants something, but they're not willing to yield to God to experience what it is that he has for them. And that's the, that's the issue. You know, um, and that's the thing. God wants to work some things out in our life, but he wants to do it his way. And we got to be willing to allow him to do it his way. You know, and I think as you walk with him for a while and you go through enough trouble trying to do it your way and end up eventually doing it his way anyway, you come to a point where you just say, well, Lord, I'd just rather it be your way. I'm tired. And I just want to do it your way. That's what I said the day that I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was July 23rd, 2004. And I, I, I said those exact words. Lord, I'm tired of doing it in my way. I just want it to be your way. Man, something powerful happened to me that day. So verse 26, yeah, he covets greedily all the day long always coveting something, but he's never going to get it because he doesn't have the, he, he's too lazy to go after it. But notice the righteous in contrast gives and does not spare. So you got the, the lazy man is coveting things he can't get because he doesn't have the diligence to, to, to do it, you know. And by the way, Proverbs teaches that, you know, we don't have to covet, but through diligence and doing the things that God has called us to do, um, setting aside some savings, not getting in debt, being diligent to work hard, all this kind of stuff. Well, well, certain things are just going to happen in your favor because you're doing what God says do. Does that make sense? I didn't say you were going to be, be the richest person in your community. I just simply said certain things are going to just work out in your favor because you're doing what the scripture teaches you to do. All right. So, but this lazy man, he's coveting. He's never going to get it. But the righteous they give and they do not spare. Remember, there's something about the right, the righteous person who loved, remember, righteousness means a person who is surrendered to the plan of God for salvation. He's given over to the things of God. He wants to give because he's moved upon by the love of God to give, whether it's giving to the things of God through the giving of the church, if you will, or giving to missionary work and outreach, or just giving to somebody in need just because he's filled with God's love. And because he's been diligent to do what God says, there's some extra stuff that he can actually or she can actually give. And so they don't spare. They're, they're moved and compelled. Verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. It's an abomination because they're wicked. Did you catch that? I don't really think it's saying that the stuff necessarily always is, is somehow tainted in the practical and the physical. But it's becoming from the wicked. Therefore, it is wicked. God told Saul, I want you to destroy the Malachites and everything they got. Don't bring nothing back. He ignores that, brings the king back with, the, with all the sheep. And when Samuel showed up, he's like, what, what am I hearing this bleeding of the sheep? Oh, yeah, well, it was good for the people. So we kept the sheep. We figured we could use those. Didn't God tell you to destroy them? In God's eyes, it's tainted. It's coming from the camp of the wicked. Their, their whole lifestyle was an abomination before God. The sexual immorality, the, the, child, the child sacrifice, the, 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 all of the worship that it entails so much drug use and sexual immorality to worship all of these foreign and pagan gods. And God says, wipe it all out. He had already given them 400 plus years to repent and they didn't. So he says, wipe it all out. But Saul decided to keep it. And there's a compromise that it speaks of. You know, there, you don't need the things of the wicked. You don't need to compromise to think that their stuff is good. And sometimes believers, that's what we do. We think the things of the world that the world has is good stuff and we need to get it. You know, maybe sometimes we don't. 
And so he says, how much more when he brings it with the wicked intent? So obviously the wicked are wicked, but then they bring it even more so with the wicked intent. It's all an abomination to the Lord. And, and we need to trust the Lord. The Lord provides. Um, verse 28, a false witness shall perish, but a man who hears him will speak endlessly. Interesting verse. Um, some commentators right to the fact that the man that heareth is the one who is attentive, who listens before he speaks and reports only what he has heard. Such a one will speak con uh, with continuance, if you will. Um, and what he says will never be falsified or silenced because uh, of, of the fact that he's reporting what he heard. Verse 29, as we get ready to close out, verse 29 says, a wicked man hardens his face. But as for the upright, he establishes his way. So the wicked man even hardens his face towards uh, the, the things of righteousness, the things of God, doesn't want to hear. But for the upright, his way is being established. Verse 30 and 31 are golden verses as we close for today. Verse 30 says, there is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? That means that no matter how much they, uh, as Psalm, Psalm 2, in the nations, they consult together, they conspire. Uh, why do the nations rage and all this stuff? It's vain. There's no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel that anybody can formulate and come, come up with that's going to come against the Lord in any level or success. And the reason I like that verse is because it says God is always going to be victorious. Amen. So therefore, if I'm surrendered to him and I'm doing what he's called me to do, there's no counsel that can, can destroy the things that God has put in your hands to do if you're following after him. Yes, there are lessons, there are difficulties, there's trials, but ultimately God is going to be the victor. And so therefore, verse 31, where it says the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. I love that. In other words, do all that you can do that's within your power to do the things that you're called to do but just understand at the end of it, and this is freeing, that the deliverance, that's going to come from the Lord. So as you prepare to begin your week and you're going to work and, you know, there's difficulty, you got a meeting, you got to meet with the boss, you got difficult coworkers, you got challenges. This wouldn't be a time to, to move around. This is probably the time to be still. Okay. You got challenges. You got stuff going on. Okay. So what, what I think Solomon is saying is, hey, do everything within your power to do. Use the wisdom of the Lord to be diligent and to, and to, and to, and to get your part done. OK, but the freeing part of this is that you're ultimately relying on the Lord because that's where the deliverance is going to come from. And this is freeing because as you leave this place today and you get ready to go deal with the things that you're going to deal with, you got to know and believe in that. Do all that you can do that's right before the Lord, but give, give him the rest and let it be his glory. I remember when um, I was working full-time in the world before I became a full-time pastor. And I remember going to work in the morning you know, listening to, it was Calvary Satellite Network on the way in, some Bible teaching, but there was stuff in my mind that I was going to have to deal with for the day. So I would get into the parking lot because a believer is on time, which means he's actually probably, or she's actually probably 15 minutes early. Because <laughs> you need to sit in the parking lot before you walk in the door of your job. This is what I used to do. And I'm like, Lord, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I'm, I'm, look, the horse is prepared. I'm here on time and I'm going to work hard. But Lord, I don't know about this meeting and I don't know about this. And there, there's people and now I don't know who's after me and who's lying to me. Lord, give me wisdom. Give me discernment. Guide my steps. Lord God, uh, teach me what to do. Lord, be with me. Guide me through this day. Lord God, give me favor and all this kind of stuff. And sometimes you pray as you go. You be walking to the meeting. You pray as you walk through the door. You know, and, and this is the thing. Everybody wants to be in full time ministry. But life for the believer is full time ministry. And so when you're walking this way, knowing that God is the one who is going to provide deliverance and guidance and all of these things, then you're walking by faith. Amen. The beautiful thing is that this is a walk of faith that we're called to as believers. We're not wimps. And so God is not going to just make it easy and he's not going to wipe all the troubles away. He's saying, no, I want to show you how faithful I can be if you walk through it. Just follow me through it. 
And that's what we're called to. The Bible says, now by these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And I love that. I keep going back to that verse because love is eternal. Love is something we experience now in God. And we'll have it for all eternity. But we won't have faith and hope up there. Faith and hope is for now. So we're called to walk by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so part of what you're dealing with is just simply walking out your faith, knowing that the deliverance is of the Lord if you're trusting in the Lord and not allowing yourself to be overcome. So maybe going back up to the first verse where I was talking about the difference, you know, you have the, the spirit, the soul, and the body. You know, give your soul to the things of the spirit. As you're here this morning, hearing the word of God and worshiping God, but leave with the heart and intent to allow that to continue in your life this week so that when things arise, you can lean towards the spirit. You can be actually sensitive, sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit so that you can hear him tell you what you need to do or maybe what you don't need to do or maybe who you can trust give you the discernment to know who you can trust and who you can't show you how to test the spirits and and not be caught up in things that you don't need to be caught up in or whatever the case may be and that applies at home at work in school wherever you go whatever you're doing the Lord wants to be involved in all of it because everybody in this room and sitting in the lobby is going to leave this place and go in 250 different directions because that's how probably many it is gathered right now at this service 250 different directions. God already knows what's going to happen in all 250 of those areas. He knows your route to work and home and everywhere else you go. He knows your thoughts are far off, the psalmist told us. As you sit here, your week is already mapped out by the Lord. He understands it. So therefore, the spirit needs to speak to you. The word needs to speak to you all week long. So you got to yield. That's our call. That's who we're called to be. We are ambassadors in a foreign land. We're citizens of a land that's far away. That's what the scriptures are saying to us, okay? So we got to learn to navigate. You can't just be, I'm just going to go to church and and I'm just going to live my life. That's not what we're called to do. You're going to fail at that. To be victorious, it's time to, as soldiers, it's time to be ready. It's time to be prayed up and read up. And ready to navigate following the leading of the Lord all week long. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that you've given us today. I pray that you would go before us, Lord God, this week. And just teach us, Lord God, how to follow you this week even more and more. Help us to hear your voice. We love you. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing. Until we meet again, in Jesus' name, we say together, amen.